What do we mean when we talk about domain and range of a function? Well, let's take a simple example first. Let's say we just have y equals x, right? We all remember what this looks like if we were trying to graph it. You have your x, y axes like this. y equals x just is a diagonal line like this, right? The slope of 1, so it goes up 1, over 1, up 1, over 1. It's a perfect diagonal, right? Let's say I was asked what the domain and range of this function are. I'll start with the domain. What is the domain? Well, the domain is just a concise way of writing all the x values that go into this function, right? And so for this function, think of all the numbers you could plug in for x. What numbers could you plug in for x here? Well, as far as I'm concerned, I think you can plug in pretty much anything, right? You can plug in negative a thousand, negative two, positive a half, positive a million point one, right? Like there's no limit on what numbers you can plug in for x, right? Like look at your drawing over here, your sketch. All of these x values, they all go up and they all touch the graph at some point. All these x values, right, they all go down, they all touch the graph at some point. So all the x values that you have, they're all valid. So there's no restrictions, in other words, on what your x values can be. And therefore, when we talk about the domain, you can write your domain one of a couple ways, but what you're going to say is that uh, your x value exists in the set of real numbers with no restrictions. This just means that x can be any of the real numbers. x can be anything. That's all that means. And if you wanted to write this another way, you could say something like uh, your domain ranges from negative infinity up to positive infinity. So this bracket here doesn't represent a point, it represents your domain, right? It represents an interval where your graph exists. Your graph exists from an x value of negative infinity, so very far to the left, all the way to positive infinity, so very far to the right. So that's another way you can write your domain. Now with that in mind, how about we talk about the range? What would my range be? Well, just like how you can plug anything in for x, because x is equal to y, Therefore, we could say that y is also equal to anything, right? Like your y values go up forever and ever and ever, and they go down forever and ever and ever. Just look at the graph. If this graph has a little arrow on the end, that means it's going up and to the right forever. And on the left end here, this means it's going down and to the left forever. So your graph never stops. So with that in mind, we could say that y exists in the set of real numbers, meaning that y can be any number, right? And likewise, we could say, you know, for your range, that your range goes from negative infinity all the way to positive infinity. So you could also write it that way if you wish. Now, that's a relatively simple example, right? It's just a straight line. But this concept holds true for every type of graph we have. For example, if we have y equals x squared, right? Let's graph that. Well, that's just your parent function for a quadratic, right? It's your basic quadratic like that. And it has a vertex down here at 0, 0. It goes up and to the left and it goes up and to the right. So if I were to ask you, you know, what values of x would you be allowed to plug in here? Well, once again, it looks like you can plug in anything, right? And if you look at your graph, it goes to the right forever and to the left forever. So you have all these x values, you have all these x values, right? So all these values on your x-axis, they're all going to be perfectly valid. And so therefore, for your domain, you'd say your domain is x exists in the set of real numbers, and that's it, right? Or again, you could write it the way we did before, where you say it ranges from negative infinity to positive infinity, up to you. But this way also works. So that was your domain. How about the range? Well, what values could you get for y if you plug in anything for x? Well, while we can plug in anything for x, that anything is being squared. And as we know, when you square a number, no matter what number it is, if you square a number, you're going to get a positive answer, right? Which is why, if you look at this graph, the only y values you have are all these positive y values and also zero, right? But all these negatives, you don't have any points on this graph that have a negative y value, right? Like if you pick the point, any random point on this graph, and you say, what's that point? The y value is going to be positive every time, right? And so for this graph, we would have to say that the range is y exists in the set of real numbers such that, so I'm going to put a line here, such that y must be greater than or equal to zero, right? Because you could get zero as a y value, like if x is zero, y is zero, 
So y isn't anything. It's anything that's positive or 0. It's the only type of answer you can get for y. So y is greater than or equal to 0. That's your range. So for most graphs that you look at, for most functions, you're going to have some sort of restriction like this on either your domain or your range. Um, but for quadratics, you typically have you know this for your domain all the time because quadratics go to the left and right forever, um, whereas their range is restricted depending on if they're opening up or opening down. Right? They're only going to have particular y values in those points that make up the function. Let's look at another type of function. Let's look at an absolute value function. So if you haven't seen these symbols before, they're not ones, they're not l's, they're just sort of these vertical lines that go up and down. And what that means is we're taking the absolute value of x. And if you haven't heard the phrase absolute value before, all it means is the distance that number is from zero. So if you have negative six, negative six is six units away from zero. So the absolute value of negative six is six. Essentially, all you're doing is you're turning that number into a positive, right? Whether it's a negative or positive to start. So if I were to do a table of values, maybe this will make things a little bit more clear. And you plug in some points, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2. And I say, what are the y values of all these? It's just the positive part, right? It's just the number. It's just the positive of these. It's just the number component of these answers. So you would get 2, 1, 0, 1, 2. That's what absolute value means. So when you graph this, you might be able to take a guess as to what this is going to look like. It's going to do something like this. You'll have a straight line going like that, a straight line going like that. Essentially what you get is a big V, right? Because this data over here to the left of zero looks like a linear function that's going down. And then this data to the right looks like a linear function that's going up, right? With a slope of positive one. Whereas this one on the left has a slope of negative one. And it's symmetrical, right? It's perfectly symmetrical. So if you go to 1, that has a height of 1. If you go to negative 1, it has that same height of negative, of positive 1. So this is kind of a cool looking function, right? Um, and if we asked, you know, what, what is the domain of this? You could say the domain is x belongs to the set of real numbers because, well, x can be anything, right? You can plug any number in for x. You can take the absolute value of any number you want. And if you look at this graph, it goes to the left forever and to the right forever. So of course, x just exists in the set of real numbers with no restrictions, right? Because x can be anything. But what about the range? Well, the range, you could say y also exists in the set of real numbers, such that we have a restriction, right? Because if you look over here at the table of values, whether you plug in a negative or a positive, the answers you get are all positives, right? So you don't get any negative y values. It's impossible to get a negative y value here. If you look at the graph, it makes sense, right? They're both going up forever. You're never down here in the negatives. So we have to exclude all the y values that are negative. Therefore, we will say that y must be greater than or equal to 0. So for your range, we're saying y exists in the set of real numbers such that y must be greater than or equal to 0. Let's do another one. What if we have the function y equals x cubed? I think I might have shown you this once or twice, what this function looks like. But it's a function that curves something like like this. It's not a perfect drawing, but it's not bad, right? So that's your cubic function, y equals x cubed. And if you look at the x values, the x values go to the right forever and they go to the left forever, right? That continues to the left. It's not going straight down. It's just getting very, very steep, right? This isn't going straight up. It's just getting very steep, so it looks like it, but it's technically going to the right and up forever. So the x values, there, there's no limit on what your x values can be. So if you're a domain, we just say domain is, you know, x exists in the set of real numbers. What do you think about the range? What's the range going to do? Right? We know it exists in the set of real numbers. We write that every time. But is there a restriction on that? Or is that it? Well, in this case, it looks like y goes up forever. And y also goes down forever, right? You have all these points over here that are negative, And you have all these points up here that are positive. And so it looks like y exists in the set of real numbers with no restrictions. So y can also be anything. And that makes sense from looking at the graph. And it also makes sense algebraically, because whether you plug a positive or negative number in for x, well, if it's positive and you cube it, you get a positive. And if it's negative and you cube it, you get a negative. So you can actually get any value for y, positive or negative, and that's reflected in the graph. right? You get these negative values and positive values. So it absolutely makes sense that y can be anything as well.
Okay, what if we have y equals x to the exponent 4? What does this look like first off? Well, if you're familiar with these even functions, they kind of just look like a wider version of a quadratic, kind of exaggerated, right? It still goes through 0, 0, but it's got kind of a wider base. And because it's so similar to the quadratic, your domain and range will also be similar. If I ask you for the domain, you'll say x exists in the set of real numbers because it goes forever to the left and to the right. If I ask you for the range, you'll say y exists in the set of real numbers such that y has to be greater than or equal to 0 because none of these negative y values have a point, right? Like if you're sitting at this point down here at a negative y value and you look to your right and you look to your left, you're not going to see the graph, right? There's no point on the graph that has a negative y value. So y has to be greater than or equal to 0. And what if we have uh, something like this, y equals x to the 5? Well, y equals x to the 5 is just a wider version of y equals x to the 3, in a sense, right? It looks like that cubed function, except it's a little bit more stretched out horizontally, right? And so for this case, your domain would say is x exists in a set of real numbers. And you would say for your range that y exists in the set of real numbers. And so we can start to see a pattern here, right? If it's odd, then your domain and range exist in the set of real numbers. But if it's even, like this last example, or your quadratic function, then that would mean that your domain can be anything, right? Your domain exists in the set of real numbers, but the range is going to be restricted, right? Your range will be limited. So that's a rule that you can take away, right, just from these patterns. Now, what if we have something different? What if we have something like y equals the square root of x, right, the square root function? If you're not familiar with this, this function looks just like this, okay? Starts at 0, 0, starts going up, and then it kind of flattens off. It's still technically increasing forever, but it just slows down with how quickly it increases. Now, what would the domain of this be? Well, your domain, you always start, you say x exists in the set of real numbers, such that, so in this case it looks like our domain is restricted, right? Because we only have these x values, we don't have these x values on the left, right? There's no graph over here, the graph's only on the right hand side. Why is that? Well, these x values are all positive. What happens if I try to plug in one of these negative x values into the equation? Right, like let's say I plug in negative 1 here. What's the square root of negative 1? Well, that's not a real number, right? It's actually an imaginary number, but for now we don't know how to take the square root of a negative. We don't think it's possible. And so because there's no real answer for when you take the square root of a negative, therefore your function cannot exist in that part of the plane, right? It only exists on the right side. So we say x has to be greater than or equal to zero. Now let's look at your range. y exists in the set of real numbers. The y values are all positive as well. There's no y values down here, so we would say that y also has to be greater than or equal to zero. Hopefully that makes sense as to why that is. Okay, let's do another example. What if I have x squared plus y squared equals 1? Now again, this is the equation of a circle. We've discussed this before. And we discussed how this is not a function, but we can still find its domain and range, right? Um, this circle has a radius of 1, so this is a value of 1. That's a value of 1, negative 1, negative 1, just like that. And now we can talk about what the domain and range are. So your domain, you could say, x exists in the set of real numbers. What x values do I have here? Well, I have all these x values and all these x values, right? Because I have all these points, you know, along the top, and you have these points again on the bottom, right? So all the x values or all the x parts of those coordinates, they're all within this range from negative 1 to 1, right? Like if you took a point out here, like negative 1.5, and you look up and you look down, you're not touching the circle, right? So there's no point on the circle that has a x-coordinate that's larger than 1 or less than negative 1. And so for this, we would say that x exists in the set of real numbers such that x is in between negative 1 and 1, or it's greater than or equal to negative 1 and less than or equal to positive 1, right? It's in between them. And another way to say this would be if you said the domain is between negative 1 and 1. 
Now I did this before with negative infinity and infinity, except I used round brackets to show that, or parentheses as you might call them. But here I'm using brackets or square brackets because we're being inclusive, right? Meaning that we're including one and negative one in our interval. If you did, you know, negative one and one like this, that would be like saying x is between negative one and one, but not equal to. See how these are greater than or equal to, less than or equal to, because you have points at those points, at those values. Well, down here, if this is what you had, if x was between negative one and one, not including those, you would use round brackets to show that. So that's the difference between round brackets and square brackets. So in this case, this would be your answer because we want to include the negative one and one. So we use the square brackets or just simply brackets as you might call them. Now, what about the range? Well, the range is going to be the same because your y values are all also between negative one and one. So your range, you could say, is y exists in the set of real numbers such that y is greater than or equal to negative one, but less than or equal to positive one. And again, you could write it this way as well, same as your domain. Okay, let's do another one. Let's say I have uh, y equals 1 over x. What values of x can I plug in here? Well, I feel like I can plug almost anything in there, right? Like what's stopping me from plugging in a million or 2 or 11 or negative 7 eighths? You know, like I could plug in any number I want. Um, but there's one exception to that. And that's the number 0. Right? If you plug 0 into here, what you have is 1 divided by 0. And as we all know, if you try to divide by 0, that will be undefined. Right? We cannot define what 1 divided by 0 is. And if you try to graph this function, you're going to get a shape that looks like this. You have a curve there and a curve there. And the reason these curves take these shapes is because we have what we call asymptotes. We have a vertical asymptote right here going through zero. That is a vertical asymptote. And a vertical asymptote is just an imaginary line that your function never touches. And it's located here at zero because, well, you can't plug in the x value of zero, right? Like one over zero is undefined. So your graph is not defined at this imaginary line. It's defined to the right and it's defined to the left. You also have a horizontal asymptote here also going through zero on the x-axis, that's your horizontal asymptote, I'll just call it HA, you can call this VA, right, that's all right. And when it comes to asymptotes, one thing to know is that typically your function, right, the line of your function is going to get closer and closer to those asymptotes, but it will never touch, right? So if you look over here, this line is going to get closer and closer and closer to that asymptote, and they'll get closer and closer together for all infinity as they go to the left, but they'll never touch, they'll just get infinitely closer. Same is true if you come down like this. It gets closer and closer to this asymptote, but it never touches. Same up here. It's going to get closer and closer and closer and closer, but it'll never touch. Right? Same over here. It'll go lower and lower and lower, closer to zero, but it'll never ever touch it. And the reason you have this horizontal one is because there's no way you can get a y value of zero. Right? There's no number for x you could plug in that when you divide it by one, you will get a y value of zero. It just doesn't exist. And so because of that, you also have a horizontal asymptote because your y value can't be zero. So what's our domain and range here? Well, the domain, you could say x exists in the set of real numbers such that x cannot be zero, right? Because of course, we said already, if it's zero, it's undefined. So we just say x cannot be zero. Another way of writing this would be domain goes from negative infinity to zero. And then you can use this special symbol here. Um, well, it looks kind of like a U. That means union. So we have this part of the domain. But then you also have this other part of the domain that goes from zero to positive infinity. So it's a way of connecting these two intervals, right? And that's what you have. You have two intervals. You have all the numbers to the left of zero and all the numbers to the right of zero, but you don't have zero. So you break it up with this union symbol. Now you can also talk about the range, right? The range y exists in the set of real numbers such that y cannot be zero either. And you could write the range the same way if you want to do it this way. You could say negative infinity to zero in union with zero to infinity. That's also an option. Okay, let's do another example. Let's say I have y equals 2 to the exponent x. 
Okay, so first let's recall what this looks like, if we can. Um, this is what we call the exponential function, and it looks something like this. And this function also has an asymptote. It has a horizontal asymptote here at zero. Call that your horizontal asymptote. It doesn't have a vertical asymptote, though. You might think there's one here, but there actually isn't one. Uh, this graph actually continues up into the right forever. It's getting exponentially more fast, though. It's increasing exponentially. So it looks like it's almost going straight up after a while, but it is in fact still moving to the right. It's just going up very, very quickly. And the reason there's a horizontal asymptote here is because your y value cannot become zero. No matter how tiny you make this x value, if you make it 0 0.0001, um, if you make it negative, if you make it like negative 10, right? It doesn't matter what you do to this x value, whether it's a positive, a negative, a decimal, a fraction, whatever, even if you make that x value into zero, no matter what you do to it, you cannot turn this whole thing into zero. So your y can never equal zero, right? So if your y can never be zero, then you don't have any x-intercepts. So there's a horizontal asymptote here. So this line just gets closer and closer and closer to the x-axis, but it never ever touches it. So with this in mind, we can talk about our domain and range. Your domain, you could say, x exists to the set of real numbers, and that's it, because it goes to the left forever, and it's going to the right forever, right? Any x value could be in there, like we said, so there's no restriction on your domain. But for the range, you would say that y exists in the set of real numbers, such that y is greater than zero, right? Not greater than or equal to, because again, it never touches the x-axis, just greater than zero, because the y values that you have are all positive values of y. You don't have zero, and you don't have the negatives, right? Just the positives. And that's it. Okay, that's your final answer. Now, so far, all the functions that we've looked at have been the parent functions. Or in other words, they've been the most simple forms of these functions that we can have. But you can also answer these questions about domain and range for any function, really, right? Any variation that has undergone, you know, any number of transformations. For example, if you have y equals x squared, well, we did this one already, but what if you have y equals x squared plus 5, right? Well, if you look at what that looks like, it's a quadratic that is located up here, the y-intercept of 5, right? It's moved up 5 units. And so when we talk about the domain and the range, well, the domain doesn't change because x still exists in the set of real numbers, right? It goes forever to the right and to the left. x can be anything. But when we look at the range, in the past, we said that y exists in the set of real numbers such that y has to be bigger than 0, right, when it was down here. But now that it's moved up 5, we can see that the y values we have are all these y values, right? But nothing below 5. And so we would say that y exists in the set of real numbers such that y has to be greater than or equal to 5. And so I just thought it was worth, you know, pointing that out, that you could have transformations on your function, and then you have to look carefully at it and see, okay, where is my, you know, cutoff, right? Where is the limit for my domain and range? Where are the intervals? And so you can have this for any type of function, right? Like you could have uh, y equals the square root of x minus 1 um, plus 3. And what is that? Well, that's a square root function. usually looks like this, but it's moved 1 to the right and up 3. So it's going to be something like this, where this is 1 and this is 3. And we have to say, okay, what x values do I have? Well, if you look at all the points on this, on this line, all those x values are all bigger than 1. Right? So for your domain, you would say that x exists in the set of real numbers such that x is greater than or equal to 1. When you look at the range, we're looking at the y values, right? y exists in the set of real numbers such that y, well, where's y? Well, all these values, all these points have y values that are bigger than 3, right? Or equal to it. This one right here is exactly 3. So you'd say y has to be greater than or equal to 3. So those are just a couple examples where we have some transformations. And most of the time, when you're asked to find domain and range, it's domain and range of a specific function that's unique, right? That has undergone all sorts of transformations, right? Either shifts or reflections or what have you. And you'll have to look at each one critically to figure out what the domain and range of that function are.